Hello and welcome to the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast with me, your host, Tim Stillman, stepping in, stepping onto the mic, not literally stepping onto the mic, that would be very, very counterproductive for the podcast, but stepping into the presenter's chair because Elliot is travelling yet again, Um, and you'll probably find out why and where he was travelling fairly soon, I think, but um, obviously Elliot was uh, with me at the game on Saturday and had a little... uh, nibble at the away day match day experience by which I mean um, we got him drunk uh, when he was jet lagged so uh, that really improved his analysis I think for those of you who listened to the uh, instant reaction podcast that came out later on Saturday evening but uh, really really great fun to kind of add Elliot into the mix um, of all of that and I know Elliot's going to do like a little bit of a video diary um, and things like that and I believe he'll be at the Bournemouth game on Saturday as well so We get to do it all over again. But speaking of the instant reaction pod, which went out on Saturday evening, uh, which was ably presented by uh, my guest today, Paul, who you can follow on Twitter at Poznan in my pants. Paul, good evening. Good afternoon. Is it morning where you are? Afternoon? Does it matter? It's morning. 20 minutes left of my morning. Well, good morning then, which will presently become afternoon for you. Um, Great job on hosting the instant reaction. And I I think um, listening back to, I listened to it on Sunday and I think what you kind of got to the bottom of now, now I'm presenting this and actually have to try and present (laughs) kind of a little bit of clarity over this game against Leicester, which we're going to talk about now. I think one of the things you guys really got to the bottom of was this was quite a confusing game. Um, in many ways. So before we get into the meat of it and some of the incidents, the starting lineup, which was interesting on this occasion, kind of 48 hours later, what's your mm. thousand foot view, your response to this this game? And what was it emotionally at the time? Uh, at the time, I was a bit frustrated that we struggled to turn our, you know, Elliot in the in our uh, instant reaction, the introduction has a, it's really good. People should go back and listen to it. I thought it was a very good feel for that away day experience, which most of us, the majority of people listening will never get to experience potentially. And uh, that was really good. I, I, I hope you, uh, I was a little disappointed during the game. The camera panned across where you guys were. And just for a moment, I th- I'm pretty sure I saw you and uh, Elliot bare chested, uh, <laughs> chest painted. <laughs> Pretty sure that was you. I think you you got him into a terrible state. We've been domesticating Elliot and civilizing him for the best part of three, four years. He looks like he's gone feral, basically, at this stage. <laughs> and we're going to have a hell of a lot of reconstruction to do when we get him back. But it's a really good piece because uh, we all want to know, like, we all want to be there. With, like, you guys are the Praetorian Guard. Actually, the Praetorian Guard is rather uh, disappointing when you find out what they really were for the Romans. But anyway, in my mind, you guys are, you're the elite, you're our, your troops, you know, the best of the best on our front lines. You've been absolutely fantastic. And there's, there's Elliot in the middle of it. Um, there's a song for every player. You get like, we, our away support was just dominant in this game. And like, that's just a constant theme. It's fantastic. The players love it. Um, to your point, uh, I think a lot of us were a little concerned, a little frustrated that we had possession, that this was another team sitting in a low block, blah, 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 blah. I think everybody knows how they felt about it. I felt that way. I mean, I felt okay. I thought we were going to win it. I thought mm. uh, Leicester were kind of a little disappointing. I wasn't disappointed, but they were a little no. disappointing. Um, I went back and watched it again, as I do, and I can tell you, uh, my reaction to it in the like you probably look back in the first half and feel was it you know were we just trying to get into our groove where we're finding our way I think it was feckin brilliant I mean obviously like I my jaw dropped really not because it was the best performance we have ever had but I don't think Lester came here or sorry you know, stayed there <laughs> we <laughs> we came they stayed there um to play that defensively and yeah. uh, I'll watch the game again. And, and then I'm like, it reminded me of um, Brendan Rogers comments in his presser. Yes. I actually listened to the Brendan Rogers presser at the end of that. And he was like, he was like, 
that wasn't how we planned to play in the first half. I'm not <laughs> entirely sure what happened. We were better in the second half. Well, of course they were. We'd scored a goal and blah, blah, blah. Um, like, I went back and, like, they didn't start out to sit in the low block. They were trying to play some football. Now, they weren't great. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying this was the greatest team ever. They were, Nor were they Sean Dyche's Everton out there just kicking shit out of you when they, <clears throat> when they weren't able to get in the game. So they were a bit more... Here's what I think happened. I think we fucking positional played to the Jesus out of them. Like, yeah. we worked it from back to front, over and back. Now, our we frustrations... We saw that fast are... start again as, as well. Yeah, we? yeah. We saw that, like, bang, we're pinning you back. And yeah, it, so that was very much off, back. Ramsdale banged it into the right-hand area. And that was one of the points I wanted to get to, actually. Um, we have all of our midfield really tight together where that ball lands. The possession kicks we get we get the ball back there's a like a throw in and we're at it and it is the fast start this is not the villa first half and i think Jorginho might be great like he's really <laughs> really good with the ball he's he's fr- front footed like he fits into this model of we push up we press we harry we lose the ball we get it back quickly uh, we cover transitions. Of course, he didn't have the athleticism a parte, and we saw that a few times in the second half in particular. But honestly, I'd go back back and look at this first half, and I think they got positional played to death. They didn't know mm. who to mark. Their markers were always moving. Much more dynamism over on the left-hand side in particular. Yep. Jorginho kind of hangs right, but yep. over on the left-hand side, you have a cluster of four players of... Basically, Trossard, who's who doesn't even bother center foring, forwarding, he's basically free in that pocket, sitting behind their midfield, and free to do as he chooses, dropping in. Martinelli's dropping in. They're rotating freely. Gets Marte, Martinelli central. They didn't know, who, like they mar- they marked somebody, and that guy was gone. Zinchenko would step up. Uh, Xhaka would take a run. It was like it was textbook positional play and i think they just got to a point where they hadn't they didn't know who to mark how to mark it and we moved it from side to side through Jorginho, odegaard uh shaka zinchenko um and like i think they just said uh we're gonna drop a little deeper and it'll drop a little deeper especially with trossard dropping in and moving around the center backs had nobody to mark and so yeah. They were, I think they were confused as fuck. I mean, they're expecting uh, it, but they weren't expecting it to feel like that. Well, that's that's the thing about this game, right? And we'll we'll come on to that because um, you know Trossard starting up front is certainly the most interesting thing that happened, just on the basis of selection. I uh, and you you hit on a lot of the themes that we're going to discuss in more detail. But like for me, this was one of the games I wasn't that worried about, and th- this could this could just be like. I mean, it's based on very little because I don't watch Leicester very much, but I just I just perceive them as a bit of a soft touch. Like Everton, I'm worried about Everton. Um, I was worried about the first game. I'm worried about this one. On Wednesday, don't get me wrong, I still think we'll, we'll probably win it, but I think it's going to be hard work and we're all going to age 15 years on Wednesday night. I just don't have that vibe with Leicester. I don't think they're good enough defensively. And so I wasn't hugely worried about this game because I thought we can definitely score against these guys. Um, and I don't think they're the type of team that are going to beat us up or, you know, like, you know, dice us, <laughs> basically. And I, and once they had Madison out, uh, yeah. which is, you know, very significant for them, I just kind of thought they're not going to carry enough threat. Like Harvey Barnes and Ian Acho are good players, but they really need Madison as a supply line. And, and, and I think so it proved. And we'll come on to in a minute whether, like, to what extent were they toothless and to what extent were we good at defence. But the the story that kind of... I, I, I retweeted a tweet on Saturday morning. There seems to be some kind of mole on Reddit who keeps calling our starting lineups um, yeah. in advance. And there was a tweet saying Inketia, you know, and, and actually the way it's framed, I think, was quite useful because the way the Reddit post said like Inketia has been carrying a bit of an ankle knock. They're going to rest him today. So it, it it's not... Inketi has dropped, um, you know, and I think that, that was quite a handy way of framing it. I'm, I'm sure there's some truth. To, like, I think basically nearly every player is playing with a knock nearly all the time. Yeah, um, I, I pictured that conversation as Arteta saying, Eddie, you've been carrying a knock. And Eddie saying, 
no, I, no, I'm really <laughs> fine. And Arteta yeah. says, sometimes you don't know, like you need an outsider, Eddie. Trust and then Arteta this. boots him in the ankle and says, <laughs> now you've got a knock, haven't you? <laughs> but, yeah. but like, so Trossard starts up front and before the game happened and we saw what we saw, what was your, what was your feeling about that when that was confirmed? Um, I was surprised because I thought it was going to be awkward for Arteta to achieve that, uh, given that, you know, Eddie had been do- Eddie was struggling for a goal, but he'd been working manfully. The challenge for Trossard is, you know, people always say, oh, he's played center forward, false nine for Brighton before. And like, usually when you go back and have a look at those games, you're like, did he really? You know, uh, mm. on the team sheet, maybe. So I never quite buy the, he did, like, you get a lot of that with Ben White played DM for Leeds. He really didn't. Uh, I went back and watched those games specifically because it's one of my pet peeves. The <laughs> He played DM for, and you go, what did he do? He man marked a guy in the midfield and occasionally he had to pass the ball. Oh, and by the way, he got moved at halftime because Bielsa was going nuts about how Leeds were playing. <laughs> Um, not necessarily aimed at white, but you know that was an experiment that lasted half a half a game, and then he did it in another game. And it was very, you know, Leeds is such a man marking team. He was basically marking their most dangerous player, who was the ten, more than he was truly DMing it. He wasn't mm. doing Jorginho, I can tell you that for nothing. <laughs> um, and so, and I thought Trossard needs the time to adapt, and he's just he's still trying to figure out how to play left wing for us. And mm. be effective from the get go. So I'm like, I didn't expect it. The one, the one thing in his favor is he had a week here, and we had a week to yep. do an adaptation. And as you said, probably what they were doing was uh, him and Mar- He was going back and forth between him and Martinelli. The fact that he would, he sounded like he considered playing Martinelli central makes yeah. me think that he either has a big concern about Eddie, or that there is a bit of a net knock. But mostly, Eddie needs a rest. And they thought this was the game to get Eddie a rest, freshened up, and to try something new. I, I think the fact I think the fact that there was a week before this game is very significant um, in ter- in terms of doing that. This is the quote from Arteta afterwards. He said, "We had the option to play Gabby Martinelli as a nine and Leo on the left, but we had to see how the game developed and what Leicester wanted to do. I wanted to have that option uh, to make the change if necessary." So you're right. He's basically saying there he kind of went backwards and forwards in his head about which way round to do it, and he was prepared to change it in game. Um, as it turned out, that as we see with the winning goal, um, most kind of most plainly of all, there was a lot of rotation of position anyway. So it, it kind of almost feels a little bit semantic. And maybe it was about which centre halves Leicester were going to play. Also with Leicester, their fullbacks off, play on both sides. Like Castagna, uh, the Belgian fullback, he plays on both sides, kind of week to week, and they. You know, your point there about Ben White, the way Leicester operate is they kind of tend to put Castagna on who they consider to be the most dangerous attacker um, because he's a really good one-on-one defender. So I think they were maybe waiting to see where Castagna was playing. But yeah, so like Arteta talks about how, and obviously they'd worked on that. They'd worked on both bases in training of Martinelli as the nine and Trossard wide and, and the other way around. But as it turns out, and it wasn't, We'll, we'll come on to some of the other uh, players in, in that area, shall we say. But, you know, we've talked a lot in recent weeks about how essentially, just to shorthand it for our listeners, Martinelli and Nketiah just isn't really a combination that works that well. Yeah. Martinelli and Trossard, I mean, ha- like in the way that this turned out, and I think something that's really revealing as well, I, I really like looking into stuff like this. On Twitter, Trossard got man of the match with the Arsenal fans. And I think that shows you that Arsenal fans have been looking at the games recently and they've been ready for something else up front. And so personally, I was glad to see this because I think we need a third option as a nine. And the way I see it, I'd rather start with Trossard there. And if it doesn't work, bringing Ketia on. 
than going the other way around. Like I think I think you you start with a false nine and then bring on the nine. You don't do it the other way around if you need a goal, if you know what I mean. So that it, it suggested to me there was an appetite in the fan base to see this. And it's very like, you know, player of the month is always the new signing. It it kind of just oh that was different. We really like that. Um but how how did you feel I guess would you do it again on Wednesday? Uh, would be my question. So there's two questions there. Will Arteta do it? Would I? Mm. Uh, so pulling on my ruthless pants. Yes, I would. Mm -hmm. uh, so would I. Trossard solved all our problems. Well, apart from the putting it in the back of the net more regularly in the box, but I think he can help there. Like when you think of what our problems were or our concerns were, Martinelli's a bit stagnant, uh, starting from the left. Xhaka... Uh, looks, you know, a little slow footed. Uh, everybody just seems a little stuck in their boxes. They're in position, but they're not interchanging positions, which is the whole point of positional play, right? You got a structure and it's, uh, you vary it from the structure and the variation wasn't there and it, it just wasn't flowing. And it makes you think, uh, Arteta used a great phrase. He was talking about, uh, errors and and mistakes in previous games he was asked a question on it and he said something like the wave uh, often starts far from the shore or from the beach yes. and he was talking about errors but that's the, true of attacks and sometimes you got to chase it back uh to where the issue may be and i think eddie's done well at a kind of a gabriel jesus impersonation uh but trossard just naturally his first move is to stop being a center forward and go move into the left channel or the wing and interchange. That's it. That's his move. His move is not to do the thing he's, he's on the, the, uh, the sheet for. And Eddie's hmm. move is to be a center forward and to then do other things. And it just stirred the pot. It was Trossard was the spoon that started to stir the, the, the pot and the swirl started, and the guys interchanged. Xhaka, Zinchenko, Trossard, Martinelli dropping in. Um, so those four players in some level of space, and on the right-hand side, we had the pod, uh, the four over there, Jorginho very much to that side, but mm -hmm. very condensed without the same kind of freedom and movement that you saw. Like the, the left had the space and the movement, and then they'd switch it back to the right in theory to finish it off. And that happened quite often. Uh, but like there was just this freedom of movement that we haven't seen since Gabriel Jesus on that left-hand side that brought everything to life. And honestly, it was great. Um, I know there's the whole more stuff in the box and more shots on target and more, more deadly situations. But holy crap, we just ran rings around them. It wasn't like when you look at our... So here are our top passers in the first half. We, first off, we had 386 passes and they had 147. That sounds like it's going to be sterile possession mm. if you're not getting uh, shots and chances dropping every few minutes. But I don't think it really is. I mean, we're obviously, there's a bit of a struggle in the box, but that's not the same as sterile possession. So you kind of expect lots of passes between the center backs, but... Saliba had 51 passes. Gabby had only 31. So Saliba's sending 20 to somebody else. Actually, he was sending most of his passes to somebody else. He was sending them to Jorginho and White and Odegaard. And Gabby was just pumped. Like, why would he pass it back to Saliba when he's got Zinchenko, Xhaka, Trossard, and Martinelli swirling around in front of him? That's where the passes were going. The movement was lovely. I really didn't go back to the center backs apart from when we were resetting and sending it forward um it was great it was really really good obviously there's that whole missing piece part of it but like it was you would show this team that video to, uh six months ago to say here's how i want you to play against a team i think we just mm. bamboozled them absolutely yeah. to the point where they kind of gave up fell back and we we almost made our own problem. It, like the goal comes in the second half before they've reset to falling back. The ball's bouncing around midfield and we hit basically kind of practically hitting them on the counter as it turns out. And in the first half, we were just too good for our own good, given that our, our finishing wasn't quite up 
to match that level of uh, positional dominance. Yeah, and I think something significant here is that, like, because we'd never done it before, if you're Leicester, you can't prepare for it. You know, you either prepare for Gabriel Jesus or Nketiah. And I think it was important that Arsenal find a third way at centre-forward. Um, and and so I, I was... Because my, my thinking was, look, if we do it for 60 minutes and it doesn't fly, we can just bring Eddie on. And it's, you know, it's probably not a massive problem. I, w- I would... Like, I don't want to over-index one game, particularly sure. against what I consider to be quite a poor defensive team. So I do this again on Wednesday. And really, my calculus is, I would. I think it gets more out of Martinelli. And I think Martinelli is a better player than Nketiah. So I'd rather get more out of Martinelli. And, and Trossard's good as well. And and I'll read the rest of um, Arteta's quote, actually, on, on Trossard playing up front. Because one of the... I have this thing, right, where I just don't really like false nines. Um, it, and, and, and also, like, false nines are a really broad term, right? We usually say it, and what we mean is the guy that we don't consider to be a striker is playing striker, like... In reality, Trossard not doing this an awful lot differently to what most nines do in terms of peeling out wide and finding space and things like that. But what what usually happens with a false nine is usually it's the small guy and he's a good footballer. Like when we used to put Podolski there, like it was really sterile because he'd just he'd have his back to go, he'd get the ball and he'd just send it back where it came from, and that's all that would happen. But what what impressed me about Trossard and what impressed Arteta as well, he said, um, he said, I think he got involved in many situations that could have ended up in many more big chances. Um, he was involved in the incredible goal that was disallowed, involved in the goal for Gabby. Um, he's so good in small spaces and yeah. tight spaces. that That's, for me, where he kind of lit it up a bit when he got the ball with his back to goal. Like, he, first of all, he's... He's got great control, but he also... I, I don't know what his upper body strength is like. I, I've never really watched him that closely. But I don't think he has an upper body. <laughs> he was, he's like really squat. Yeah. And, like and he's got legs. That's helpful. And the, yeah, he's got a midsection. He didn't really have an upper body. Then the, the head where, where do you hit him if you're a centre-back? Yeah. That's the thing. His like, head starts early. <laughs> he's like he's quite evasive, right? Like, And yeah. he's good on both feet, so he can go both sides. Like I said, I don't want to over it because I still think that there's a world in which we start this on Wednesday and, you know, Everton have Tarkovsky and who's the other centre-back, Connor Cody, and they yeah. just smash him up in the air or they don't care where he goes because they just want to defend them. Like, that is, for me, like, it's... But, but for me, there is now a third way we can go to if and when we need to. And I think that's really important to find that out. But, you know, you referenced it there. Like, you look at the goal. I'm not sure how much of a rehearsed move that was because actually, Martin, when you watch it, when Gabriel clears the ball, Martinelli and Trossard are both on the same line. They're both on the touch line. Yeah, no, it's not planned. there's, There's a bit of mayhem going on with ping pong. Yeah, yeah, because it's a clearance as well, right? So it's not a structured move. Like, Gabriel comes into a 50-50 and wins it. But Martinelli then thinks really quickly. He's like, oh, Trossard's got the ball out there. Well, I'll just I'll make a run in here. And what, what it's really similar to, if you go back and watch the reverse fixture, the home game in August, and watch Arsenal's first goal that day, Gabriel Jesus scores it. And But the build-up is very similar. Jesus gets the ball right on the touchline. Martinelli moves inside him. Jesus passes to Martinelli. There's a bit more texture to it because, like, there's a couple more passes, basically. There's a few more Leicester players and Xhaka, there. Xhaka, like, knocks it down. Yeah, yeah, Xhaka Jesus. to Martinelli and then Martinelli to Jesus and Jesus curls it in. But the principle at the start of that move is the same. Jesus is right out with chalk on his boots on the wing and Martinelli runs inside him and then Xhaka runs inside and all of a sudden you've got an overload. Yeah, and that's what Arsenal got here that we haven't seen for ages. So, I think I it was really... brilliant from Trossard. I mean, you got to say yeah. it. It's, it's like, like the nutmeg is beautiful as well. Like that's very he's... intentional. Yeah, you got to nutmeg the guy, but you got to put it nutmeg and put it on Martinelli's toes while he's running at speed. I mean, it's it's perfect intersection, and off they go. And it's like he just knew he knew what he was doing. He had options. He picks that one out. He's so clever. And I think back to Arteta's point, like uh, 
look, Tim, I don't care that you don't like a, a, a <laughs> false nine. I don't like false good. nine and I don't like back threes. For me, those are the things that happen when teams get desperate. Yeah. That's, that's my, not always, but that's generally what I think. When a manager does one of those things, it's usually an experiment or, oh, shit, like the striker's underperforming or we can't defend, like, they're, they're very. They just strike me as very. Other than in very rare situations, like Firmino, obviously Firmino, false nine, brilliant. But like for Liverpool, but do you know what I mean? Like I always feel like it's that I temporary stable. I, I don't care for your stinking <laughs> opinion. No, look, if you're Arteta, you you have dreamed for the day that you would have a quality team full of quality players playing positional football. And you ap- you get to have an absolute out and out false nine striker. Now Gabriel Jesus is pretty damn close to that, mm-hmm. but Trossard has no internal conflict because the first thing he knows is I'm not a striker. <laughs> so- he's, he's like not an anything. Like he he is like the the way I think of Trossard is he plays in an area right. Yeah, and his and the area, area he wants is to inside play. left. Yeah, yeah. And I've been pushing for a while to get Trossard as in, inside left, despite I have my my agenda for Granite Jack and all that. And I don't want to see him dropped. This gives me everything. Granite Jack is on the pitch. But the first thing <laughs> Trossard does, if you look at all his touches, he's in the left eight spot. Jack is my, my current analogy for him as a load bearing wall. Like he lets the other guys do their things, Zinchenko, Trossard, Martinelli. And he says, where do I need to be? And maybe he gives a little extra cover or he takes up a position, tucked it kind of like that inverted full back thing to make sure that we're covered down the transition. I know that's super exciting for everybody to know that <laughs> you're in the hands of Jorginho and Xhaka for counterattacks. But guys, <laughs> it's all about positioning mostly. Um, and so I absolutely effing love it. I suspect uh, Arteta loves an out and out um false nine concept well mm-hmm. wasn't quite sure he'd be ready to be, he wasn't quite sure he'd be there after all this wasn't the move he was looking to make for originally in the window but sometimes you know the beauty of a situation unfolds i think he might just love this a little bit mm-hmm. and it just open like we saw it it just opens everything up now as you say we got to do it again we got to do it against everton which may be a much greater test. It may also be the thing that solidifies it as an absolute killer move. So it can go both ways. Uh, I don't think Everton, I suspect Everton are going to be surprised how different this game is for them. They know, already know it'll be a bit different away. The support won't be there. Kind of their bubbles burst a little bit. They're, n- they're not quite as new manager bouncy. I think they're going to see something else that they haven't seen before, which is Cody and Tarkowski with nobody to mark, Trossard between the lines in space, uh, and his superpower is on the edge of the box, first timing it to other players. He's so quick. I, I was trying to come up with a, a term or analogy for this, but he's got a different frame rate to the players he's playing against. It's that kind of side to side movement, like Odegaard has it. There's a few players that they're going at 60 frames per second, and everybody else is at 30 or or 50 frames per second. And his side to sides, that tight space thing, uh, he's going to create all sorts of chances for, for players milling around him, Martinelli going inside, outside him, etc. And like there were lots of runs that weren't found or weren't weren't made against yeah. Leicester in that particular area. Agreed. Uh, yeah. And like I think like what was wrong? Why weren't we firing in the box? Do we need a taller strike to no? Those guys need to find each other on those runs. And this is all new to them. This is game one of Trossard centrally, but immediately moving to that eight spot, Sinchenko, Shaka, Martinelli, who moves when, who makes the who makes the run, um, who comes through the center. Like th- yeah, this could like better fast. Yeah, like in maybe in another game or two. Like that Martinelli run for the goal is quite opportunistic. Yep. It's kind of, oh, he's there. I'll go here. It's Whereas on. maybe with another game or two, he's already there. You know, he's already, before Gabriel clears the ball, he's seen, ah, oh, Trossard's over there. Maybe if I just move 10 yards in field here, um, the, and it becomes a bit a more There were a lot instinctive. of runs in behind in particular that weren't made, uh, mm-hmm. even by Martinelli, where where he's like, 
oh, okay, I, I don't normally get the chance to get in behind here. Like, not even that deep, like kind of a, a mid block. And like Xhaka or Zinchenko are, are thinking, well, why haven't you made that move there? Where he's coming, he's now coming from the middle and kind of working his way out again along the line, thinking it's not coming to him. Well, it could have been coming to him. Xhaka mm-hmm. made a few runs. Okay, we're not we're not thinking, hey, that's the guy we want on the se- uh, on the center forward spot receiving the ball. But like those guys are making runs and the guy on the ball is not looking up or vice versa. The guy on the ball is thinking now's the time. And like, you can see it, the space is there. It's not, it's not an impossible pass. It's all about the guys being on the same wavelength. So I, yeah. Yeah. And the goal we have disallowed um, as well is, yeah. is close to that. Like again, you know, I, I and you referenced the Everton away game there and quite rightly, because I think that was probably <laughs> like the nadir of our predictability. Yeah, um, And I tweeted about this on Sunday, but if you look at Martinelli's heat map in that Everton game at Goodison, it's just like, it's a big glow worm out on the left touchline. Whereas yeah. if you look at his heat map in this game, it's it's all over the map um, type thing. And, and one of the things I think that was really interesting in this game as well, if you go back and watch um, the highlights in particular, like again, I, I looked at Xhaka's heat map at Goodison Park and his heat map in this game at Goodison Park. It's actually in like old Xhaka area. It's that left center circle where it's all really bright. Whereas here, he's kind of all over the map a bit. And one of the things I really recommend people read uh, Lewis Ambrose's piece on Ask Blog about this game because he talks about how players went outside Martinelli as well and not just Trossard. So there's um, there's a chance we have, I think it's, bef- yeah, yeah, it's in the first half where um, we have the ball on the right and Martinelli is in the centre forward position and Xhaka's outside him and the ball comes to Xhaka and Xhaka puts a cross in which is deflected wide when really you should cut it back for Martinelli. But we saw Xhaka wider a lot more often. We saw Zinchenko wider a lot more often. Like this move of putting Trossard up front, it wasn't just about the interchange between Trossard and Martinelli. It's very, very clear that what, you know, what we've been talking about, what most people have been noticing, that kind of stasis on the left-hand side, obviously the coaching staff have noticed it, um, but <laughs> but they're the guys that get paid to try and sort it out. And, and it just looked to me, I don't, I don't know if it, jumped out at you at the time or more the second time viewing, but there was a lot more, there were different players on the left wing. It wasn't just Martinelli. Yeah. Yeah. No, there was a constant rotation there. And, uh, you know, there'll be people thinking, I don't really want Jack on, on the left wing. And that cross was cut out. He actually had a couple of very good crosses uh, across the box. And we've seen it in the past that weren't jumped onto. Uh, I think it was one of those where, the things that caught your eye with Xhaka in the first half were kind of the moments he was a bit stodgy or a little slow. I think if you go back and look how those four worked, like Xhaka's not perfect in this role, but it still worked. Uh, there were a lot of good moments with him involved, both going forward and and uh, out of possession. I'm not saying that as in, uh, you know, a defense of Xhaka, more a defense that that level of with intelligent players, that level of movement just works, and you, you kind of get over a little bit of, oh well, you know, we could upgrade on Jacker. Yeah, we could in the summer. Um, right now, those four work really good together, um, and uh, like you definitely saw Jacker, you saw Zinchenko. Um, getting stretching it out wide because Martinelli may have dropped in. He's mm. not necessarily central all the time. Trossard may be not quite central. He he might be in the eighth spot. Uh Xhaka deeper, Zenchenko on the wing, or vice versa. Uh, the interchange between almost the pairs of Zinchenko and Shaka of Trossard and Martinelli. And one of the nice things about when the center guy say it's Trossard or it's Martinelli making his way back to the wing Uh, while we're in possession is he has the option then to suddenly peel off and make a run in behind his fullback who's wondering when his guy is going to show up because the guy was marking Trossard has come in or Zinchenko has dropped they never know who there's like a two or three yard or a one or two second space where you're waiting for the guy you don't know whether to go and meet the guy who's coming to your spot or to wait till he shows up 
And if that's Martinelli making his way from the center back to the left wing, at that moment, he can just peel in behind and there's a through ball. They never know, you know, the guy's looking at their number from behind and they don't know who they're marking. I think you see that. That's what I loved about the first half. Over on the left-hand side, they'd no clue what, who they were marking next. Yeah, basically. yeah. There's, there's a chance, um, I think, where Saka uh, kind of smacks one over the bar from about 25 yards. But mm. when I was watching it back, I, I paused it. And it was Martinelli centre forward, Xhaka left wing, and Trossard left eight. That was the arrangement of players, as like the ball was over on the right hand side. But that was the arrangement. I, I think Gabriel wins it back and gets it to to Saka. But that was the arrangement of players. Like all three of them had completely, you know, like they're on some kind of rotating plinth or something, jumping yeah. to different lily pads. I was thinking, like, like you know, one of those mechanized sushi things where they bring the dishes. Around yeah, yeah, the restaurant, yeah. 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 That, was, that was last night. I'm like, hang on, I'm getting pictures of rotating sushi here. <laughs> so I, I figure we were gonna. And by the way, we, we are gonna come onto the disallowed goal. I, I think that's kind of a separate discussion, which is why I'm not taking it chronologically. Um, so we will come on to that. But I did want to talk about Xhaka. Um, and you know we we've been like relatively generous to him there, but yeah. I, I know Elliot wouldn't forgive me or us um, if we didn't consider the the darker side of this conversation because again his his assessment um, on the instant reaction was very much when it was one nil with twenty minutes to go and we were doing the controlly thing he was okay in there but he felt and and I think with some justification that perhaps a more naturally creatively minded player might have created, you know, you're talking about like runs not being spotted and things like that and, and balls not being played in sometimes. And, you know, I think we kind of know who we're talking about when we, when we, when we kind of say that without saying the name, like what, what do you make of, I guess, Elliot's assessment that maybe if we had, maybe if we had like Vieira there or, you know, or, and other that we might have won this game by more than one goal or would could we have drawn it 1-1 because we didn't have like that that level of control that Xhaka does bring in those situations uh so i definitely see the concern and share it um and i've talked fairly liberally about uh, out loud about you know Trossard at the left eight i, I can really see that one Vieira just looks a little slight to me when mm. you don't have the ball. Though in the last couple of games, when he's when he's had some minutes, he looks more uh, physical, more uh, more like he thinks he be he belongs on a Premier League pitch against bigger teams. But still, he hasn't had to. Uh, well, I'll pivot to my like. I still think Jack is a load bearing wall, one of those walls. Yeah, yeah. That, it's after you knock it, a big hole in it and your ceiling collapse, you're like, oh, that's what that thing did. Yeah, because th that's the thing. We've talked about this before, right? Like when you when we, in our minds, we take a player out and put a player in, we just lose all the flaws of the player yeah. we take out and we get all of the, the good stuff, the player we put in. And 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 like personally, my view on it, I, like I I don't necessarily disagree with Elliot. I think there's another goal in this game if we like the combinations between Martinelli and Trossard were really nice. Zinchenko varied up his game here as well, and perhaps yeah, Jack is the one you look at and think ah oh, you you could have come out of this with an assist. But at the same time, I think the position I'm in at the moment is I would reserve that as a as a a substitution move like if 25 minutes to go it's nil nil and we're struggling yeah that that's when I do like Vieira for Xhaka look at some point we're going to have to do it from the start but I'd I'd leave that for the Europa League and at the moment I'd keep that up the old sleeve um for the first substitution but just um yeah 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 go on so like he would have come out with an assist in this game in fact had Trossard's goal stood. Yes, and that that was a. I was going to come on to that when we talk about because it's actually it, it's a lovely touch. It's a really nice touch. It is, yeah. And then Trossard controls it by kind of knocking it to his right. Takes one more touch. The classic cutting inside kind of winger, even though he's he's much more central. Shapes it into the far corner. Absolute peach of a goal. But Jack is on the far post. Uh, 
winning the knockdown off the corner. Um, like it's one of those. I agree. There, are, if you had a different player there in in a number of moments in the game with quicker feet around the box, but I think it's a little less that Jaka isn't doing what he did earlier in the season that we liked, but. He's just one more player that Trossard in that position fixed in this game. Mm. Um, there's a lot of good in there beyond the kind of three, four, five moments where you think, gosh, I wish somebody with quicker feet was in that spot at that time. Um, he was coming, I, th- I think, starting to come into his own in the game and out of possession. Like for several seasons now, we've talked about, oh, you know, party comes in and he be central and, you know, can, can, uh, Xhaka adapt to a different role? And the answer in every case when you throw a new challenge his way is he's really good at saying, okay, you guys have the dance floor. I'll do the things that need to be done, not just defensively, but in terms of making runs behind, not because he's the best guy to do it, but he'll do it. He'll make that run. He's intelligent. Um he has a kind of he knows kind of what needs to be done at different stages in a game, different positions, different phases, in and out of possession. He's one of the first to switch on, which is good, because he'll be one of the slowest getting backward. But um, you know, he is tuned in to he has that anxiety about well, what happens if we lose the ball here? Mm. That I'm not sure you're gonna get from Vieira or maybe even Trossard, despite his ex- experience. He's kind of for Brighton, he was kind of the free man. That was the guy they said, you go do your thing. Well, it will be great if he also has the other half of the game wired in, but he may not. And that's the, this is the perfect way for me to get what I want, which is Trossard <laughs> dropping in the left A position, uh, still the, t- the security, the load-bearing wall of Xhaka. I get Martinelli. I get Zinchenko. Uh, the right side, the way I like it. Um, I lose my, my buddy, Eddie Nketiah. Um, but if we manage to get our way to a title and he plays important minutes as a sub and in Europa League, he'd be good too. And you, you win things by being ruthless. I think like I, I am an Eddie believer, but shit, I'd, I'd absolutely roll the dice on Trossard again, because what's the ceiling of that working well? It's huge, Mm. right? It's another way of playing that we start to nail down. Whereas if Eddie has a decent game against Everton, it's kind of a so what. Um, yeah, yeah. Unless he he suddenly finds something new we haven't seen, but we could nail down something here that if you're the opponent, you you, you definitely don't want to see that showing up on a regular basis. Yeah, um, ceiling's Everton, pretty high on Trossard. Yeah, yeah, and Everton sitting there at this moment in time don't know which one we're going to do. Which a week ago would not have been the case, and when we played them earlier this month, they were very well prepared uh, for what was coming. So I, I think there's definitely something to that. I, look, we, we always have the Xhaka conversation. And I think Elliot's angle as well is that there's perhaps an element of redundancy with, with Zinchenko there as well. Like, I, again, I don't necessarily like it. That's all coming. That's all in the post. I, I personally, I'm not quite there yet and I'd be more inclined to judge Xhaka's contribution as quote unquote a left eight when Jesus is back like if he feels redundant when Gabriel Jesus is is in the mix then then I I do think that that's that's a problem maybe in this game for actually and the other thing I think you have to consider about Xhaka is he's he's an athlete like he has to be one of the the best athletes we've had whatever you think of him as a player or anything else, or as a character, or and, and he's plenty divided opinion on all of those. Like as an athlete, he he is actually quite incredible. It it must be said because he's incredibly robust, and he like he's one of those players who just never looks tired. To me, yep. if you know what I mean, like I think I he understands like the mechanics of his body um, very very well. Um, and and yeah, I I think there's there's a lot to be said for that. But yeah, I think the Europa League, like I I'd, I'd probably be inclined to give Vieira a go there from the start and and see what we've got. And you know, I I think that's all coming. But I I wouldn't go there quite yet. I'd have I'd leave it up the sleeve as a substitution. But actually, all of that kind of reminds me really like if you're Kieran Tierney and Arsenal have made all of these adjustments, have gone to all of these lengths to try and get that left flank working, and none of them involve you, 
even from the bench. I mean, I guess just quickly, we don't, we don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but I mean, if you're him, you're just sitting there going, I don't fit in here. You depressing, depressing bastard. Uh, like, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think I hear the theme music for Annie coming <laughs> welling up here. An orphan in a hole. Incredible Hulk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, somebody needs to come in and, like, we all love Kieran Turney. He's a really good player. Uh, you know, the Europa League's coming up. I, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm throwing him a bone. Uh, but yeah, uh, like, the upside is he's a team guy and all that. And, like, we are going for the title. And it, everybody who plays a f- even a few minutes is going to be important to us getting over the line with this thing. So there'll be all that that will keep him ticking along this season. And it's going to be a very, very tough season of growth if it keeps emotional growth for him, if it keeps playing out like this. But at least when you're going for the title, maybe even winning it, that's a whole other scenario then. The team's kind of not going anywhere. You're not really figuring. You, like, And the summer will be, there will be a, a serious decision to make because he's he's got too much to offer. He should be a starter. Um, he needs to be a starter. I I think he would have committed his career to Arsenal, but like that's the problem with football. It just clicks on, and it's not that he's not of the requisite level. He's just the wrong, could be the wrong template for yeah. what we're going to need. But things change quick in football. He had to go at the inverted uh, fullback thing. Clearly, it's not uh, his natural uh, mode, and like, mm. uh, yeah, I, I love. Does to feel him. very writing on the wally, but he is in the song. He's got that going for him. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah song you, too, not, not just you, any song. You can like you can slightly adapt it to Zinni at the back um, without without miss, missing too much of a beat. Uh, then the supporters would match the ruthlessness of the exactly. manager. <laughs> it, it made me laugh because we were singing that at, um, Villa last week and it suddenly occurred to me that both players were on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Mikel Arte, he knows exactly what we need to bench both of these players. No, obviously it wasn't you know quite like that. But look, we've, we've spent 47 minutes without talking about... Well, no, we talked. you talked a little bit about Trossard's disallowed goal, but talked about it as a as a fine piece of execution, a fine goal, which it really, really was. Great finish. Absolute pandemonium in the away end. I think there's something about the way this goal arrived as well on the back of like wave after wave of pressure. It yep. really felt like it was cut. Like when that went in, it was you coming. know when you, yeah, you, you, a goal goes in and you just go, yeah, that was coming. And it, and it feels like extra satisfying because like, the more pressure you put on, you kind of edge forward a little bit in your seat, and then it happens. You're like, ah, oh. it's it's almost a relief. But obviously, it's- it gets disallowed. Um, look, I'll, I'll talk, I guess, a little bit about the stadium experience of it and everything in in, in a minute. But like, what's your what, what what's your your kind of response to it? Like, in it's terms, it's a decision of- that can only be made because VAR exists. Yeah. It's like some of the stupid like I like the idea of VAR for offsides. That's that's the one thing I do like. I also like it when there's a terrible goal given against us and it's chalked off because I had a look at it on <laughs> VAR. Um but like there's no way this ever gets given, caught, and it, like it's it's it is a foul, but it's only a foul because VAR exists, because nobody's ever gonna see this shit. And nobody like apart from the, no one cares. Like no one cares. From, yeah, I, like I, I'm not even sure the goalkeeper. I mean, he probably gave a bit of a protest, but like it's, he's got too much going on to know exactly. Like you're kind of busy, and there's the next phase that comes after it. Like Jacka knocking it. Like he has time to reset and get nowhere near the shot. Like they had that. The one that I think is equivalent on the offside is they brought started doing this thing in the World Cup where if you're offside in the first phase, say there's a free kick coming in, the ball's coming in, and you happen to be near the centre back who clears it out and it drops to like your your midfielders on the edge of the box and 
you, you knock it around. One of the guys who touches the ball at that stage, 10 yards deeper, three seconds later, happened to be in an offside position near the center back when he cleared it. That is now, even though you score a beautiful goal from there, that's now offside because the guy who touched it 10 yards onside was at one stage in his former life. In a, <laughs> It's like, what lino would be able to keep track of the seven guys who were marginally offside or not on a free kick mm. uh, without VAR? Like you just say, okay, everybody's back onside and everybody touched the ball is well, well onside. This is football. We'll play some football. You don't say, now, was of the seven guys in a line, three or four of them were like, who gives a fuck, right? Yeah. Nobody who touched the ball was was offside while touching the ball or even close. It's just like a bullshit thing you can do because you have far, VAR that kills great goals, the experience of football, and like it makes more sense to people watching it on TV it makes i'm not saying it makes good sense it just makes more sense um it's a killer like this was 3 minutes the game was stopped to have a look at a guy holding a guy's hand given some of the things we've seen in the past it took them 3 but they didn't add on 3 minutes of it, of added time at half time blah 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 it's just like it's bullshit it's bullshit for the experience of football which is a visceral thing um, and they've got to find ways of not having VAR being this technical laboratory for something that's visceral, live, and whatever. Yeah, it's sometimes the bar for these decisions, right, is like who would have complained or said anything if this goal was allowed? Like I bet like match of the day, whatever, wouldn't have even looked at it. Like no, nobody would have looked at it. There was no complaint in the stadium, and and it's really dangerous for the stadium experience because, look, my team scored a goal and I really enjoyed it, and then it was taken away two minutes later, and that is exceptionally unsatisfying, right? And as much as look, I I'm I'm a VAR absolutist. I hate it. The only situation in which I would use it is for violent conduct because the game stops anyway. If there's a bad tackle or something like that, that's the only time I would be satisfied with a VAR intervention. If someone like cleans someone out, does a nasty tackle, the ref doesn't see it, they should be sent off. And like usually a guy's down getting treatment anyway. So like I, I'm kind of fine with it. On that and that only, that would be my my absolutist position. But like when you're in the stadium, basically like that goal's disallowed. That means every goal that is scored is on the table, basically, because you're there. You've got no idea why this has been disallowed. You have to wait like two minutes for it. And it's it's so like even, like uh, there'll be lots of people listening who who want VAR and like VAR and that's that's absolutely fine. It just depends like different strokes for different folks. No one wants it for this. No one. The people who want VAR generally don't want it for this. They want it for like big errors or like you say like offsides or someone handles the ball or something. People don't want goals taken away because like someone's hand got held he held and his it's, hand it's it's the, the th and so like as as a stadium experience like the game died after that the stadium died the game went flat and it's like you can't do that like the whole essence of football's popularity is first of all the flow of the game and all of the interventions that the lawmakers have made over the last couple of decades have all been about promoting the flow so the back pass rule what a brilliant brilliant rule that is whoever like there was no clamor for that really but someone very very clever was like we we need we we need to stop teams passing it back to the goalkeeper and over, over and over again we need to keep the ball in play brilliant tackle from behind brilliant i i, I don't want the guy who scissors someone's legs off to win i want the guy who can go around him to win brilliant intervention this I think this is just such a big move in the wrong direction because it's all about slowing the game down. Really, I think we've done that really bad thing that you should never do, which is submitted to people who get outraged on Twitter. 
in terms of introducing it, in terms of trying to quell noise. But there are also, even putting all of that aside, right, there are so many logical, <laughs> logical fallacies about this decision. First of all, like that, what Ben White did to the guy, like, yeah, I, I kind of, if that had been called in real time, I'd, I'd be like, okay, all right. Yeah, it's soft, but it's a foul. But that versus what goes on at corners, like, I'm sorry, like guys rip each other's shirts off and nothing is called. So there's yeah. that. Then and you can say it's on the keeper, right? But like all sorts of stuff gets done to keepers too. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Like when we conceded that goal at Villa earlier in the season and – I think Ramsdale was fouled, right? But I, I promise I didn't complain about that, about VAR not intervening, because generally speaking, I don't want them... Like, I think the referee broadly saw what happened there. I think he made the wrong decision, but I can live with that. I can accept that. I don't want that stuff being re-refereed. But then, like, so first of all, they're suppo- and this is another thing that's so frustrating, they keep moving the bar drastically. We were told a couple of weeks ago that the bar was going to be higher and now you're disallowing goals for this. It's like, well, why have you changed your minds again? And that's it's very frustrating about the laws of football in general. They always do these things that last about a month. Like we're going to really pull people up on corners and then they stop doing it. We're going to let it flow. Then they stop doing it. We're going to raise the bar. We're going to lower the bar. Like, you know, they're just like running rings around themselves. But then you get that Saka penalty incident. Like, and it's like, well, you've got to re-referee that then. Like, and and I just I'm kind of I'm tired of apologies from PGFL, but I'd I'd love to kind of privately talk to the referee and the VAR and just be like, guys, what are you thinking? What are you thinking in your minds when you take a goal away for that, but you don't consider what happened to Saka? Like a high enough line for a pen. Like, what are you thinking? What is going through your head? Like, please try and justify that to me and explain what has made you do that. Because this is the other thing, Paul. Generally, I don't really care that much about, like, refereeing errors or whatever. But with VAR, I do. Because you've stopped the game. You've slowed it down. You've taken all the fun and the emotion out of it. So you have to get it right when you do that. Like, at least give me justice if you're going to do that, right? Yeah. Like, that, that's that got to be, for me, that's a small payoff, right? For other people, it's a bigger payoff. Fine. Do not stop games for things like that and then create more injustice. And now I do get bothered about this stuff. Like, if that penalty, pre-VAR, goal gets disallowed, we don't get a penalty. I, I wouldn't even talk about it. I honestly wouldn't. I'd just be like, okay, he didn't see it, he saw it, whatever. But when you're re-refereeing games like this, you have to get it right. And I just don't understand what is going through the mind of the referee or the VAR when they treat those incidents so differently, when they keep changing where the bar is. And and on top of that, as well as just like really taking a hammer to the experience as a fan, I I, th- I hate it. I absolutely des- despise it. Um, oh, sheesh, so- Tim. Uh, I'm really <laughs> glad that you're not somebody who goes on about refereeing or bar decisions and don't like to talk about it too much. I do have – look, it's clear the relationship between the referees even and the fans has been – there's an alienation there. There's a real – like the, the gulf between – it seems almost irredeemable, but I do have an idea. April the 1st is coming up, April Fool's Day. You know, every now and then you see some lines drawn on an offside and you're like, <laughs> those, those don't look quite right. If they did one where they gave the correct call, but they drew some absolutely <laughs> terribly drawn lines. And then <laughs> afterwards they're like, come on, guys, can't you take a joke? You, you football <laughs> fans, you pride yourself on your sense of humor. It could be a real confidence and kind of reaching out to the football fans correct decision terribly drawn lines <laughs> hand drawn all bockety kind of a bulge just where the player is that's my solution just draw a, a cock levity. or something yeah 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 like <laughs> oh, big old cock and balls or like 
pair of boobs or something like give us something for christ's sake but anyway yes. that, that that's that and to be fair i think you know by now if you've ever listened to this podcast before you know where i stand on var and things like that but like this was a really egregious and particularly like a couple like look this isn't lester's problem it right? was a so, sham of a hang on tim it was a sham of a travesty of two shams of a travesty <laughs> i don't think was, you've gone heavy enough it was sham square great yeah <laughs> but like yeah like and particularly when pgmo ol have just had to apologize to us for like not intervening <laughs> like it, it at this at this stage it feels like someone's having a bit of a laugh with us but there we go anyway we get and, and actually like i think getting the goal early in the second half was so important for that because because actually when the goal that did stand came it did kind of come out of nowhere we deserved to score in that period where trossard scores and then when we actually score it still feels a bit like you know arteta reference that we we found the injustice of that difficult to deal with and everything went a bit flat and actually then out of nowhere gabriel just whacks a clearance and it's like oh oh there's some space here we'll score and it wasn't really like a a worked move you know and yeah and there was so... lots of ping pong around the halfway line that pulled everybody closer and closer mm. and so their line was pulled right up everybody was kind it's of a transition a goal yeah it is and like they think they're about to be attacking we think we might be defending a bit so like everybody's in a very kind of tight 15 20 yards gabrielle just kicks it over the top and uh it's uh i, I couldn't quite believe it it's like on 45 seconds in the first half, Gabrielle pops it over the top. It's in the back of the net on 50, 51 seconds. Mm. It's like, as you say, it's kind it's of out of nowhere. They're not set in any kind of moving back towards their own goal situation. Trossard's like a little bit brilliant at that stuff. Like he, he hits that perfectly into the spot Gabrielle or Martinelli can run onto. Uh, Martinelli's kind of off balance, but but shapes it into the far corner. Uh, you could say Thierry Henry style. That's that's so yeah. overused given that half the goals in the league are some guy curving <laughs> it into the far corner. I don't know how he trademarked it half, uh, late into footballs, like almost 100 years after football started. It, a, it's still a bit called like it. the Makaleli role, as if like no <laughs> one had ever played in defensive midfield before. Yeah, but we'll take it. It's the Thierry Henry goal, especially from the left-hand side. And it's it, in a way, it's kind of like the fact that, uh, as you said, the first... The first goal that was waved off, the Trossard goal, we saw it coming and coming and coming, and like maybe it never would have come because like mm. maybe it'd just be more the same. This was uh, another fast start for us in that we were on it. it it's another game we got out early. I, it's probably more visible to you that the that the our team's coming out before the other team after a slow start. Maybe that maybe that's something. Maybe that's nothing. But we were out before they came out. We were up. We were at them. Uh, they made the mistake of getting sucked into a really high line and uh, we crucified yeah. them. And that, that maintains that kind of record we have where uh, goals in the first 15 minutes of each half. Um, and, and that's kind of a, a healthy sign because that's what we're trying to do. I, I think that there were, well, there are a couple of other kind of small things. I think one of them we kind of covered which was um, I was going to ask about like our dominance versus maybe how few clear cut chances were created, but I think we covered that with the kind of so. you that, know understanding the, the movement. That's the switch up I think that can realistically be made apart mm. from like something a different player or something like just learning that movement. The kind of we're pretty good at the old toothpaste these days. It's just that yeah. bit of the toothpaste onto the brush. And I think that's like those intersecting crossover runs in behind Martinelli doing it or Trossard, somebody dropping. Like if we keep Trossard for the next game, uh, that's one conversation. But like there's a big conversation to be had if it's Enketi. Now we have to come up with something new because with Enketi centrally, uh, Martinelli does tend to get two guys uh, yeah. marking him on that side. Whereas if it's Trossard, he'll just peel that run uh, to the left in behind those two markers while 
Martinelli keys off that and moves inside, kind of drops in and inside, and suddenly they're like, "Oh shit, we're marking nobody." And who's what was that draft just behind my back? As <laughs> as Trossard kind of arcs his run in behind, and like you, you wonder why Eddie doesn't do it. <clears throat> but it, there are many things in life where you're like, "Well, why doesn't he do that?" And it's yeah, it's not. And like I think he's been doing pretty good and making the runs, and but he's a center forward. Uh, yeah. where many things are hardwired. It's not that he couldn't do this. It's like he's adapting how he plays. Trossard's d- going back to what he does every game, which is that free space over on the left. Yeah, it, it's a bit like saying, why don't you write with your left hand? Yeah. Um, sometimes not that simple. I, I think another thing I was going to bring up, but actually, again, I think we've covered, was, was Jorginho and on that right-hand oh. side, he oh, passed I to, to Saka four times. Yeah. We're seeing that that slipping Saka into the channel. Yeah. He did that again, particularly oh, in the first half. I want half. to talk about Jorginho just mm. a little bit. Yeah, yeah, go uh, for it. There might be a new conductor in town. And I think it's, again, a bit like maybe we underestimate how much Arteta might love a true false nine, despite the fact that you, Tim, have some <laughs> kind of bee in your bonnet that the rest of us <laughs> could give a flying fuck about. Um Jorginho might be the new conductor in town. What if Arteta loves Jorginho at that position more than we even do? What if yeah, yeah. Thomas Party? Like I know this is anathema. Well, if I precisely knew what anathema meant, then I would know it was anathema. But like this might be something, and I know it's very hard for us because like Party can do it all, and he's great, and he can do what. Jorginho does and he has the other side of his game maybe that's how we see it maybe Arteta Mm. doesn't think party can actually do everything that Jorginho can do the like Jorginho hat is is a template that Arteta was looking for at one stage he is brilliant in terms of tempo like and Mm. you see him waving his arms and pointing at runs Martinelli Martinelli was to the left of the midfielder and while Jorginho was on the ball and he's pointing at him saying, yeah, you were blocked there, but you needed... Now, he's he's just made the pass somewhere else, but he's coaching Martinelli saying, you needed to move inside on that. You were mm. clear, clear open between the lines. And like Jorginho all the time is looking around. He's so on it. Uh, he's good, like... He, he's he got is, lovely feet in tight spaces and that, yeah, that's yeah. something I didn't I didn't... Like the swap of feet to get away from from players, I, I I hadn't really seen that in this game before. Yeah, and I'm not saying that Arteta that Arteta should or Arteta will, if you like, move away from party. I mean, I don't. I'm not getting too carried away here, but like, it may not be that easy a decision for uh, for Arteta as it is for us, where we're like, oh well, a par- party can do it all. Yeah, Arteta wants to get his level of play several levels above where it is right now we're very happy with it. we want to keep it ticking along we want to get party in we win with party he can cover but like arteta maybe i want to t- i can i have a player who allows me to who keeps it simpler at times he doesn't dribble past he doesn't break through but he fa- like arteta used to do this job and he kept it pretty simple and it was tempo yeah. and he switched it and like I don't think we always get the importance of a guy who knows the tempo, the switch, which side to move it to, who's who's so much on the wavelength of what this uh, juego de position uh, or what, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think Arteta I really think it could be very interesting. There's a selections for Everton. Uh, you know, party may not be 100%, so he has that in his pocket. But exactly. Like, but I don't think... He's quite. He may not be quite as much the bench option backup as the rest of us like to think. I completely agree. I I think he'll play minutes in every game, um, pretty much. And I I agree with you. I I so I think he'll start against Everton, um, right? And and I think you're right. I think part his fitness situation at the moment. Just you can just say, okay, actually, Thomas, we're going to give you another couple of days. You know. 
your injury history is not great. Let's make sure let's make sure you're properly back, kind of thing. Yeah. I, I think you're right. I think he really likes Jorginho in that role. And you know, we saw with the substitution late on, yeah. the party came on in the in the right eight, Erdegaard's yeah. position. And yeah, I like I don't think we'll ever start a game like that. I don't know, maybe we will, because just because we won't take Erdegaard out, but I think we'll see plenty of combinations in game and think like, I think Jorginho, if he stays fit, will play some part in every single game, basically, whatever the game state. I think if we're chasing a goal, we could see him come on for the reasons you say, because he has that that nice judge of a temperature of a game. And and I think some of his passing as well, I think people sleep on it. Like that dagger ball into Saka, in yep. the right channel. We saw it in this game. We saw it plenty of times against Villa. Like he, he's not he's not a side to side merchant. Um No, and he, he he we haven't seen it yet, but he has that over his shoulder no look pass behind the defense and the the little chip passes when when the the opponent is pushed back in their box, the chip over the top to somebody. Like I think we think he's quite a dull player because Chelsea asked him to be quite a dull player with the ball they mm. had other ways of progressing at a you know they didn't look for their creativity centrally it was very much kind of use wing backs and he's got way more in his locker and uh, like i think he was pretty much one of our our most progressive passer or thereabouts in this game um mm. yeah I, i'm not saying Jorginho is going to be our starter for the rest of the season ahead of party i'm just saying i th- I don't think Arteta finds it quite as easy to say to turn his back on Jorginho as a starter as no. the supporters will. And and also like we convinced him to come to the club in January, right? And he was I know Chelsea are a bit of a bonfire at the moment and I and I fully realize as well that maybe he looked at it and was like, mm, I, I could win the league here." But he was he was convinced to come yeah. to the club and I don't think I don't think Arteta's pitch for him was You'll play when Party's injured. You'll play in the Europa League. I, I think you're right. I think he's going to be a really big player, and that doesn't mean he'll play every minute of every game. But I think he will be involved in every game, and I think Party will be given every chance to get back to full fitness. Um, you know, in in a way that he wouldn't have been um, pre Jorginho. Put it that way. E- even El Nenny, you know, even in like the El Nenny time, as it were, I, like I think Party starts this game, even if El Nenny's fit, and you know, in a world yeah. where we haven't signed Jorginho. But I, I guess to finish, going to ask a, like a relatively abstract question here about the game. Leicester only had one shot in the entire game, and it wasn't on target. Obviously, they didn't have Madison. Where do you stand on? And one of the things I think Elliot spoke really well about in the instant reaction, he talked about like being in the stadium, you realize how much work Saliba and Gabriel get through because we really do leave them on their own <laughs> quite a lot and they have to defend a lot of space and you can see that. But where do you stand on the kind of Leicester just being completely toothless or us defending well? Like, what does your obviously it's a bit of both, right? Um, it's not one of those things, but w- which end of the spectrum are you closer to? It's a bit of both. Uh, much more credit to us, though, because it's not just that we defended well. The Our pressing game was there in a way that it wasn't against Villa in the first half. Like You can have three guys up front pressing their defense, and they can just stroll through you. And that's what I saw in the first half against Villa. In this game with Trossard, Odegaard, Saka, uh, and and the lads behind them. We were very fr- front-footed in snapping s- stuff up uh, if it started to break as they tried to play out. The amount of pressure we had pushing them back, the dominance we had in positional play, meant that when it came, when they popped it to Harvey Barnes, I mean, you, you would see him, he'd be wide with couple of ge- guys bearing down on him as the lo- the long ball came to him we saw it coming from such a distance because they were basically trying to hit it from so deep uh mm. from the amount of times we mopped up everything in front of us uh and then gabriel had the to me he was the guy who was cleaning up everything you know you say about a yeah. a, a keeper you know that they put the ball 
just where he wants it to save it kind of thing. It's the right height, the right everything. And Gabriel had a monster game in terms of interventions, tackles, covering and stuff. But also, like I played center back maybe once in my life, and it was a game in which just everything broke for me. And like I was kind of, I got the man of the match thing. And I'm like, in my heart, I was like, yeah, but like every time I was somewhere, the ball was there to be won or the header was like, or the tackle was there. And like, it was good and it was fast and I slid in for tackles, but they were all right where I wanted them to be. Gabriel had that kind of a game here where he mopped up everything. He was great. Now he had a few key moments where, you know, there was, there was a one V one down his side early on in the first half. In the half first half. Yeah, to yeah, show. Yeah. Uh, Ian Nacho, I think it was, to the touchline, uh, uh, or rather to the byline, and he managed to uh, make the tackle and clear it. Like, he was great. Saliba was much more involved in our passing, and in the, like, the right side was much more crowded and complex, and he was involved in, like, he was the guy who was getting into difficult situations and handling them. Um so, like, our centre-backs were fantastic in this, but I think our success defensively was largely uh, about the dominance of our front play. And yeah, we saw later on when we started letting them into the game. So I, ha- I have a new way of looking at... I mean, it's, it's only new in terms of how I frame it for myself. I'm not the first person to come to this. But these substitutions you make on a little later on in the game where we have this debate about should we have gone so defensive and should we have gi- given up shouldn't we just uh, have possession and dominate and stuff? And like, you should, if you're good enough, I feel that there are times in the game and this, this ended up being one of those where you're in a better position to defend and attack based on the energy of the other team. Sometimes you're safer them having the ball and you being in your shape and uh, uh, less vulnerable to the attack than if you're you have the ball and you're attacking and you're more dangerous potentially it's not ne- you know i think immediately we all know what i'm talking about here yeah um, yeah because uh, they uh, like leicester yeah. without madison they've got two looks right which is ian acho goes into that right half space because he wants the ball on his left foot barnes goes into that um sorry ian acho in the right half space barnes in the left half space and without madison there there's no join up but yeah. you're right. If if you're getting hit on the counter, that's exactly where the ball goes, right? Yeah. And and that's that. You're right. Where, where we defended well was largely a symptom of keeping them so far back that they had to knock the ball into those channels, and Saliba and Gabriel ate them up. But you're right. Like later in a game, and perhaps you know we asked Saliba and Gabriel to do that a lot. You know they they centre backs can get tired too. Um, yeah. Like like my reaction in the stadium was I felt we'd like on 75 minutes, I remember shouting like, no, this is too early. Like I could sense on about 72, 73, we were a bit like, let's win this game 1-0. And I was like, no, do that in 10 minutes w- yeah. was my call at the time. Um, in, in in the end, I, I, I concede to Arteta and the team. It was all right. They didn't do anything. So... And and it's not even like they came close to do anything. So I don't think that's just like. And I think sometimes the energy is changing between the two teams. And like yeah. you'd say to yourself, we don't want to defend from seventy two or seventy three minutes on. But also, you can be in denial as a as a manager, right? One of the things experience wise is to read that the energy the other team now has decided they've nothing to lose. They're basically going to pull the goalie in hockey terms. They're going to go for it. And the energy is starting to change and you just, you say, well, we're not necessarily, we'll be more secure and potentially more dangerous if, if we make the adjustment, I can get on a taller player or two, if they start banging in crosses, you know, Odegaard party. Um, yep. Tommy Asu. Yeah. That was late on, but like yeah, yeah. It made sense. Um, uh, I think it's, you just read, read the energy. Uh, yeah, and not confuse it with your own energy as a manager. That's the trick. Is it is it me whose energy has changed, or is it my team? Exactly. I I had um a really very similar game earlier in the season that Arsenal women had, where they they won one nil at Reading, and it was very very similar to this game. Reading had like really no shots, but the last fifteen minutes, Arsenal kind of decided to defend it, and actually the manager Jonas Idabel he put an extra centre back on, and I asked him about that afterwards, and I was like you know, we were very dominant in this game. Do you feel like that was conceding? And and he said, 
this is not what I want to do. And it's not what we talked about before, but he said, sometimes you've got to read your players. And I could, and to be fair at that point, and you've got to do it before it's obvious. Yeah. Right. That's that's, like, you do that. Let's see. Let's give them five minutes where our energy is wrong is probably the decision you say next, next time when I know it's the time I go with my gut. Yeah. He, he said like, I had to respect like, my players were te- like not telling like literally he yeah. said like my i could tell my players wanted this they wanted that extra center half on they were tired they didn't have any more to give we weren't really under a lot of pressure but we were like or uh, he he basically game intelligence right it's like okay i can see where this is going let's get that extra center back on let's make sure that there's no knockdown or set piece or anything and and yeah he said like look I don't want to do that. That's not what we talked about. We didn't plan it, but sometimes you, you've just kind of got to do it. And I do think that's probably what happened here. And like I said, like less, it's not even like we hung on. Like Leicester didn't create anything at yeah. all, even even in those last few minutes. So you know, I, I think, like I said, I don't think it's scoreboard analysis to say that that was all right in the end. But at the time, I was like. I, I'm fine with that on 85 minutes, definitely. If you're if you're one nil up away on 85 minutes, of course you you can start thinking about closing the game down. I was worried they'd done it too early, but yeah, I, I'm you know we we had Jaegers on the train pool. I I didn't have my best head on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what the hell are you on about, Tim? Debate me about what you were you were sobering up. At best, at that point, <laughs> yeah. And here yeah. you are talking about the energy of a game. <laughs> my, my energy had, had I was hiding my face in my coat during stoppage time. Like you could barely feel it's... your limbs, and now <laughs> you you your sensing of the energy of a game. Yeah. Super. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That that's why my radar was off. But anyway, um, we've done really well to do eighty-one minutes on this game. We were I talking never doubted before. This. You thought it was going to be like thirty minutes. I'm like, oh uh, yeah, I was like, I reckon we can do this in under an hour. But there was I, like a... I've got that many more notes to get through. I'm only on <laughs> that's page two of my notes. Uh, I'm showing <laughs> Tim my notes on the video. If you're not, the, the, that's the thing. Like the, there was a there were a lot of things in this game that I think happened in the abstract, uh, like the thing we were just discussing. But then there's like you know. The VAR was a, call. It was abstract the for goal. you, Tim, because you were hammered. <laughs> Every, everything was abstract uh, to me at that point. And, and on that note, um, I think we'll close this one off there. We will be back on Wednesday with an instant reaction to the Everton game. I don't actually know if Elliot will be presenting that or not. Um, or what his coordinates will be. But we'll also be back with a main pod on Thursday um, after the Everton game and looking ahead to the Bournemouth game on Saturday. Uh, And Clive should be back for the instant reaction on Wednesday and the pod on Thursday as well. I don't think we'll do any rewatches of this, particularly with the proximity of the Everton game coming up and 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 our own kind of absences uh, that we're nursing uh, um, at the moment on the podcast. But um, I thought Scott and, and Matt Giant Guna did a great job um, on the instant reaction. I thought that was a, a really considered and, and, and entertaining Thanks, look at the game. Uh, yeah, very much so. But um, until, uh, if you're a patron, Wednesday night with the instant reaction, and uh, and if you're not, Thursday, when we'll be looking at the Everton game, um, Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks to you, Paul, who you can follow on Twitter at Poznan in my pants. Woohoo! And I was your host, Tim Stillman, on this occasion, and I'll probably be on the Thursday pod. I won't be on the instant reaction because I'll be at the game on Wednesday, um, where I'll probably also be drunk. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> but still, given it large on the calls the manager made on seventy-three minutes, I'm gonna st- if I keep talking, I'm st- I'm gonna get like Twitter DMs from like AA or uh, Jehovah's Witnesses <laughs> asking me if I'm an alcoholic. To which my answer is. I am a functioning alcoholic, like a lot of the UK population. Yeah. <laughs> a semi-functioning one. Uh, anyway, and on that note, uh, thanks very much. We will speak to you on Wednesday slash Thursday. Until then, uh, goodbye, and we'll speak to you after Arsenal 10, Everton nil.